So I hope that it's clear that the, the design of a discontinuous Galerkin method can really re revolves around the choice of numerical flux. So that was this f hat on the boundary. This was ambiguous, right? We have two values for phi to pick from, uh, and we have a choice to make here. We can either cho choose the left side, the right side, the center side, or any sort of weighted average between them. In the assignment, we saw that we took an, an upwind uh, value, and that made intuitive sense. But is that is that always correct, or or uh, maybe for more complex nonlinear problems, uh, that might not be appropriate? So what kind of guidelines do we have in our uh, choices for these fluxes? Well, we have certain properties that we would like our fluxes to have, and that's what we're going to talk about in this video. And these, these properties are the consistency of the flux uh, and the conserva uh, conservativity of the flux. So those are two properties that I would like to explain and illustrate. Now, before I do that, though, I, I kind of want to introduce a little bit of notation that's going to be useful, uh, because there's a couple of things that I'm not quite happy with in the way that I have to write things uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in these formulations, these DG formulations. Um, so the first thing is here that we have these integrations over these elements. And as we also saw from, from the assignment, what we're really doing is after this, we're going to sum over our elements. And so what I should, really should be writing is, is a sum over elements, integration over element uh, volumes, and then also integration over element uh, boundaries. Um, but I, I still don't quite like that because I want to have to, to, th to think about the elements. I, I like to think about the original physical problem, which is just defined on a, a domain. So I want to be able to think about integrations on domains uh, rather than integration on, on elements and summing that. That's, that's too numerical for me. Um, another problem that I, I see right here is that we have a phi plus and a phi minus. Uh, so, so do we have to predefine a choice of plus and minus on every boundary, or, or how, do we, how do we go about dealing with that? Um, and, and we can actually solve both of these issues uh, simultaneously, uh, simply by, by changing the way that we write these things. Um, so I'm going to introduce two new domains, if you will. And the first one is going to be defined omega tilde. And the second one is, is going to be this, this gamma. And omega tilde, well, that's already kind of illustrative of, of its relation with the original omega, the, the actual domain on which we define a partial differential equation. But now there's a tilde on top here. So what this is going to be is, is the union, oh, the union, of k, and we typically write this as a sort of a plus here, and we have a, a, a subscript i here. So let's say we're summing over all, all elements, yeah, let's write it like this. Why this, this symbol t now is the set of elements. Yeah, so this is a sum over all the elements in our set of elements. Well, you can think of that simply as the mesh. And now we define a new uh, domain, omega tilde, as the union of the elements. But the important thing here is that this excludes excludes the partial case, yeah, the element boundaries, that is not inside of this uh, domain, omega tilde. Yeah, so it's it's a volume, but it's sort of missing these, the interface skeleton, and that's precisely what gamma is. Yeah, gamma is going to be the union, again, summed over all the elements in our mesh, of partial k, our element uh, boundaries. So this is the mesh skeleton. So, well, that, that already hints at what I want to do here. I want to replace this sum over k in each one of the integrals now. I want to replace them by an integral simply over omega tilde. And now I'm allowed to do that because, well, this is only the element interiors. 
And even though the gradient of V, for instance, right here, is not well defined on, on, on one of these jumps, right, uh, across uh, an element uh, on, on an element boundary, well, those are precisely excluded from our domain, right? So it's, it's, it just feels like a notational thing, but it's, it's actually quite important to keep track of these things. And naturally, this, uh, this sum over the integrations over, over the boundary, well, that's somehow going to be this gamma. But we have to be a little bit careful here, because if I sum two of these, well, then we have a contribution on this boundary from either side. And I'll have to add these together. And again, I'll have uh, left and right values, so I have plus and minus values. And we already saw in the last video where I, I went into the assignment in a little bit more detail, that that gets a little bit messy. Uh, so in order to handle that, I actually want to introduce two symbols that simplify this. And those are the average and the jump symbol. So the average symbol, in the note here by curly brackets, is defined as half of well, the values on either side. Yeah, so I get half of V plus plus half of V minus. Yes, yeah, so this is going to be our average. Average of, of uh, well, you can evaluate this. Um, yeah, okay, good. And then the second one, well, we have an average. The second one is going to be a jump, which I denote here with these square uh, brackets. And now you may have a very intuitive notion of what a jump should be like, uh, but I, I, I suppose that my definition of a jump is going to be slightly different, because what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll introduce the normal vectors here. Oh, that's not a normal vector. So I do V plus times N plus, and I add that to V minus N minus. And this is a, a very strange uh, definition if you first look at it, but it actually solves a lot of our problems in terms of uh, the ambiguity that we have on pluses and minuses. Um, as you can see, I don't have to introduce a negative sign. I add two contributions, V plus N plus and V minus N minus. And in the one dimensional case, if we have N plus simply being plus one, right? We have a, a one dimensional domain, so we have um, let me call this the plus element and this the minus element. And then we have here, um, well, then n plus is actually going to be equal to minus 1. And n minus is going to be equal, so this is n minus, this is n plus. It's going to be equal to plus 1. So then you would have minus v plus plus v minus. But if I had to find this the other way around, then you would have gotten... then you would have gotten plus V plus minus V minus. So that already illustrates that we have to be very careful in our definitions of what is the plus element and the minus element if we wanted to find our jump with the minus sign. But right now, the way that we have defined our jump, there is no minus sign. There's no distinction between what element is plus and what element is minus. We have, uh, we're simply adding the two together, irrespective of uh, of uh, which one I have defined to be plus or minus. It's just an addition of, of the values on either side. Same thing for the average. Yeah, so the point I'm trying to make here is that these operators are symmetric. Yeah, let me actually just very clearly state this. So suppose, suppose that we had defined our jump as this. Now we have uh, an unsymmetric operator. Yeah, the, if I the, flip my... If I define my elements in, in 1D, it might be clear, but if I have a 2D case, then it's going to have a very different result if I have plus, minus in these elements, or uh, minus, plus. And that's an annoyance that I would like to avoid. And it's precisely this new definition, where I'm introducing the normal vectors, uh, that uh, re removes that ambiguity, because now it's the same thing uh, on either side, so it's symmetric. Uh, and in the 1D case, this is going to be the same thing, right? So that's, that's what I just tried to illustrate. Yeah, this is going to coincide with your intuitive notion of a jump in the 1D case, uh, but it's, it's a, a generalization for um, uh, higher D cases. That also doesn't uh, uh, suffer from the, the ambiguity. 
Okay, I feel like I explained that more difficult than more difficultly than, than was necessary, but I hope it's still clear. Um, yeah. Okay. So now we have a new domain omega tilde that excludes the mesh skeleton, and we have our mesh skeleton gamma, and we have these two new operators. Now there's one uh, a little mathematical identity with these new two operators, the average and the jump, that I would like to write down. And then we can uh, actually rewrite this, uh, this equation into something that is much more simple, much more elegant. And the equality that we're going to use is that if I integrate on a certain edge, an edge in 2D or a face in 3D or a point in, in, in 1D and I integrate the expression um, say u plus dot n plus so now I'm assuming that u is a vector multiplied by v plus and I add that to an integrator on the same edge but now values on the other side so u minus dotted by n minus times v minus so that is pretty much exactly what we would end up with right here right we have integrations on boundaries and now we're trying to add everything together so you get an integration from both sides so you have to add these two integrals on the same boundary but evaluate it on either the the one side or the other side then this is going to be the same thing as the integral on that edge of the average of u dotted with the jump of v plus the integral of e of the jump of u multiplied by the average of v. And all of a sudden we, we have no distinction between what element we chose to define plus or minus, right? There's no notion of pluses and minuses in this final expression where you might say, well, there's notions of plus and minuses in the definitions of these operators. But again, this is symmetric. It doesn't matter what you call plus and what you call minus. So this is an identity and uh, I'm actually going to ask you in the homework to show this because I want you to play around a little bit with these operators because they're so important for DG uh, methods in general. Now let's uh, think about this a uh, little bit though. Um, so I'm saying here I have a vector and if I have the average of a vector, well then that's going to be a vector. Right? I'm simply summing half of the vector on either side. Yeah? So this result here is going to be a vector. That's why we have a dot product here. And actually the the jump of the scalar is going to also be a vector, right? So that's a, maybe a, a bit of a funny um, result from our new definition of a jump, that if I have a scalar value, then the result of a jump is going to be a vector. So this is going to be a vector, that's going to be a vector, and we are dotting this. The jump, now let me start with this one, the average of a scalar, well, simply taking half of the, si uh, the value on either side, so that's also going to be a scalar. The jump of a vector is going to be a scalar. So we have uh, v dot n, v dot n. Yeah, so that's going to be a scalar. Yeah, so that's why in the first one I had two vectors that have to be dotted, and in the second one I have two scalars that have to be multiplied. Now one more thing to realize is that um, well, we have this normal vector in here, and now it looks as if the normal vector has vanished, but of course that one is hidden in, in the in the jumps, um, the jump here and the jump here. Yeah, so these two normal vectors they haven't vanished and they're in the, in the jump. Now this seems like an awfully specific um, equality, but this is actually the equality that we need all the time. And that's because pretty much all the time you end up with an integration by part steps that's going to give you precisely this. It's always going to give you a vector dotted with a normal multiplied by scalar. Uh, maybe that's not something you've you've uh, noticed yet, but that's that that is pretty much always what happens. Yeah? Also, in very simple cases of of um, of a diffusive flux, then you would get on the boundary you would get gradient of phi dotted with n t 
times d. Well, that's exactly a vector dotted with the normal multiplied by a scalar. Yeah? So then we can use uh, this equality. And also here, because we have to use the divergence theorem, we have a vector, remember this is a vector, dotted with a normal multiplied by a scalar. Yeah, so we'll use this, uh, this identity um, quite regularly to get rid of all these uh, annoying integrations on either side of an element, uh, because now we just have an integration on the edge. We don't care about whether that's the inside of an element, the outside of an element. Uh, it's just going to be an integral over an edge. Okay, so now we're going to use our new domain, our mesh skeleton, and these two operators in this uh, um, identity. And by doing all of that, we can replace this weak statement with the following. Find our solution, phi h, in our space vh, that is our discontinuous Galerkin approximation space, a finite element space, such that the integral over our broken domain, omega tilde, of phi t, derivative with respect to time, multiplied by our test function v, minus the integral over our broken domain uh, of the flux function, which is vector valued of phi h times or dotted with the gradient of v plus the integral over our mesh skeleton gamma of the average of f hat times dotted, and that's a vector, dotted with the jump of v plus the average, well, let me write it like this, times the jump of f hat times the average of v. And that has to be true now for all choices of v in that same space to define our discontinuous Galerkin approximation. Okay, so this is something that I like much, uh, much better. Um, we have integrations over complete domains, right? And uh, one of those is missing a mesh skeleton and the other one is precisely the mesh skeleton. But still they are uh, global domains, so not sums over elements or whatever, um, where we have... Um, recognizable differential operators in our volumetric domains and we have well some additional stuff uh, on the boundary and that's precisely what's going to define our discontinuous Galerkin method. Okay, um, I said that in this video I wanted to talk about consistency and conserv uh, conser uh, uh, conservability, conser conservation of these flux, uh, uh, numerical fluxes. Um, to keep things nicely separated, I think I'll do that in the next video. Yeah, so I'll actually record that right away, but then we have a bit of a distinction between different videos. Okay, see you in a minute.